Welcome to the Agentic Schools Manifesto series. This is the audio and video versions of the book in which I introduce the catalytic pedagogy philosophy of education. My name is Don Berg. I am the author of this book and also the host of the Agentic Schools podcast. Preface. Why has, as historian Larry Cuban put it, quote, the age-graded school and the grammar of schooling remain secure, end quote, despite over 130 years of reform efforts from every corner of the society and the industry. Back in 1938, John Dewey predicted that the school system would be reform-proof until a specific theoretical key to understanding education was found. Unfortunately, everyone seems to have forgotten his prediction and as a result failed to look for that key to making systemic changes. This book proposes that the key, a theory of experience, has been found. However, the psychological research community that has been developing it for over 40 years does not yet realize that it has accomplished that task. The self-determination theory, also known as SDT, research community, set out to understand human motivation, and in the process happened to also answer Dewey's challenge. In short, experiences are educative when primary psychological needs are satisfied, motivations are autonomous, and engagement is agentic. Most schools are organized in ways that undermine all three of those factors in both students and teachers. The rampant disengagement of a majority of both students and teachers is clear, long-established evidence that most schools throughout the world are substantially ineffective and inefficient. Success happens in spite of the system, not because of it. That can change, but only if SDT is recognized as the missing theory of experience that Dewey called for. This book contains 10 chapters, 3 appendices, and a bibliography. If you are listening on YouTube or on your favorite podcast service, you will be missing out on numerous footnotes, the illustrations, appendices, and the bibliography. The PDF and fully illustrated video versions are available as membership benefits from Deeper Learning Advocates. Anyone who signs up for membership at $5 per month or more will be eligible to get the PDF and the illustrated video series. A physical book is an option for members who sign up for $10 per month or more. You can sign up to become a member for any amount per month at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. Now on with the book. Epigraph. The trouble with traditional education is that they do not consider the other factor in creating an experience, namely the powers and purposes of those taught. This lack of mutual adaptation makes the process of teaching and learning accidental. There must be a reason for thinking that certain materials and methods will function in generating an experience that has educative quality with a particular individual at a particular time. It is not the subject, per se, that is educative or that is conducive to growth. There is no subject that is in and of itself educational. There is no such thing as educational value in the abstract. John Dewey, Experience in Education, 1938, page 45. Chapter 1. A Toxic, Unchanged Grammar of Schooling. At school, most children in the world are alienated rather than educated. That negative assessment is no surprise to anyone familiar with the endless stream of attempted reforms over the past 130 years. What is surprising is that all those reform efforts have made only trivial surface differences. But the truly shocking fact is that the complete lack of progress was accurately predicted 85 years ago. That prediction is valuable because it clearly identifies a precise reason why reforms fail. We are missing a key scientific fact that any educational reform must be based on before it can ever create sustainable systemic improvements. The good news is that the key has been revealed by over four decades of solid scientific research. The bad news is that it is currently being ignored by most school leaders, and effectively utilizing it will be a menace to school bureaucracies. Are you ready to reflect deeply on your school and your leadership? Are you interested in leading your community to make sustainable changes that go against the status quo? If so, let's clarify the situation of educational leadership today. 
According to the compelling scholarly cases presented in Larry Cuban's books, How Teachers Taught and Confessions of a School Reformer, no meaningful systemic changes have occurred in the American public school system since at least 1890. Despite both persistent complaints and repeated reform efforts. There have been changes to trivial surface features, such as classroom furniture and teaching technologies, but not to the central core of schooling that matters the most for educating children. From the perspective of my expertise in psychology, the same is true in the majority of non-public schools in America and everywhere else in the world, too. Despite big and small campaigns from every quarter of the industry at many different times since schooling became compulsory, as Cuban put it in 2021, quote, the age-graded school and the grammar of schooling remain secure, end quote. In other words, the default paradigm of education has remained rock solid. Schools writ large have been consistently portrayed as a failing system in one way or another for well over a century now, taking the 1916 book Democracy and Education by John Dewey as a convenient reference point. In that massive tome, Dewey presented numerous ways that the school system alienated children from learning, teachers from teaching, and frequently produced unintended negative results. He thoroughly accounted for the flaws in bureaucratic school systems. Dewey, despite his extraordinary insights into what was, and still is, wrong, was only vaguely aware of how to make things right. That book, and many others by authors of every persuasion, has inspired a variety of folks in every generation since then to make the incorrect assumption that educating children will result from doing what they imagined to be the opposite of all that wrong stuff. The ones who claim Dewey as a direct inspiration, called themselves and their schools progressive. Generations of other critics and education folks, both progressive and conservative, have merely added nuances to the points he made about the wrongness without adding any truly new insights into what could make things right. They created a variety of school models that they hoped would do right by children. Most of those hopes have been and still are getting dashed against the reality of the toxic grammar of schooling, the default paradigm. The most important major symptom of the systemic failure of schooling is the persistent scientific observations that a majority of students and teachers are disengaged. Those observations are well documented, but they get little attention because few people understand the true educational impact of disengagement. Engagement is, unfortunately, treated as a form of psychological icing on the cake of schooling. What matters about widespread disengagement is that it causes both students and teachers to get accustomed to shallow instead of deep learning. This is critically important because shallow learning is not adequate for meeting the demands of today's complex world. In 1938, after over two decades of public celebrity and appearing to exert a major influence on schools both nationally and internationally, Dewey published a tiny book called Experience and Education. In it, he accurately predicted why he and all those after him would continuously fail to change the school system in any meaningful way. Dewey's little book was based on some lectures that he delivered to a major gathering of progressive educators. The essence of his message was, you don't know what you're doing. I know this because I have realized that I don't know what I'm doing. I will only come to know what I am doing after I have the ability to accurately and reliably discern an educative experience from a non-educative one. In order to accomplish that task properly, I must have a robust theory of experience. Only a proper theory of experience can liberate us from vague, unreliable, and highly biased notions like, well, I know it when I see it, or foolishly relying on the mere acquisition of grades, test scores, diplomas, and degrees to indicate that a person is educated. Since I don't have a proper theory of experience, I know that I am unable to accomplish that task accurately and reliably. Plus, none of you have one either, so we're all stuck till one comes along. In an amazing intellectual feat, he explained why Cuban, 
would find exactly what he found many decades later. Dewey had correctly reached the conclusion that he was the blind leading the blind. School systems worldwide have been persistently reform proof because of the lack of a theory of experience that reliably distinguishes educative from non-educative experiences. In essence, the school system has forever been educationally lost at sea, and the true nature of the problem has been obscured by a form of collective blindness. Just because folks are blind and lost does not mean they never reach their goals. It just means that they are stumbling about chaotically because their navigational feedback is unreliable and or ineffective. To put it another way, everyone who succeeds within mainstream school systems achieves their success in spite of the system, not because of it. Fortunately, we can now do something to effectively change the situation of schooling because a proper theory of experience has recently come along. The scientists who did the basic psychological research upon which this theory of experience is based did not realize that they were accomplishing that task. Now that the task has been done, any educational goal that practitioners have must be subservient to the psychological principles established by over four decades of research in the psychology of motivation. This is subservience in the same sense that medical doctors, as biological practitioners, must be subservient to the biological findings of the basic science that informs their practice. Let me state the core of my perspective in a starkly logical, ahistorical, and apolitical way in ten statements. One, the term school must refer to some form of institutional support for learning. Therefore, any institution that claims to be a school, yet compromises learning, must have its claim to being a school called into question. Two, the idea of a minimally functional school is posited in order to encompass every possible philosophical perspective and or institutional structure for schooling that might be contemplated and or used. Three, there are eight direct universal causes of human well-being across all ages based on solid scientific evidence. Air, water, food, shelter, sleep, relatedness, autonomy, and competence. Four, evidence of compromised psychological well-being includes controlled motivations and disengagement, according to the science of self-determination theory. Five, learning is compromised by ill-being, both physical and psychological. Six, any minimally functional school must necessarily cultivate well-being in their students. Seven, Providing instruction is but one of many possible forms of support for learning. 8. In any minimally functional school, the eight direct causes of well-being must take practical precedence over instruction, independent of any and all rhetorical stances, e.g. back to basics, college preparation, science of breeding, etc., that might say or suggest otherwise. 9. If an institution that calls itself a school compromises the well-being of the people that make it up, it follows that it should not focus on instruction nor create additional pressure on students and teachers to perform academically, but rather it should primarily focus on providing support for the primary needs of everyone in the school. 10. Academics and instruction can still be provided but those provisions need to be monitored and modified in a manner that is scientifically plausible for establishing and maintaining well-being, with acknowledgement that this involves mitigating compromises to well-being that are caused by factors beyond the school's control. Based on this argument about the necessary learning function of school and the overwhelming evidence that disengagement is rampant, it is clear that most schools in the world may not deserve to be called schools. However, with the right supports, they can become proper members of that category. Of course, we are not aiming to create minimally functional schools. We want maximally functional schools. Getting maximum function to happen in schools is why there are so many more pages to go in this book. This manifesto presents an outline of how to transform school systems worldwide based on new scientific insights that were not available to Dewey within his lifetime. 
The gist, in non-scientific terms, is to protect your students and teachers from the bureaucracy, because bureaucracy, by definition, routinely violates the psychological principles that the scientists found. The default dominant paradigm within education causes folks embedded in the school system to undervalue and or misinterpret many of the psychological insights that have been found. It does not help that Dewey's brilliant prediction has also been consistently ignored by the entire education sector, resulting in their failure to search for the theory of experience that they have needed all along. This is a manifesto, therefore it does not explore all of the nuances and details. If you would like to explore this perspective more thoroughly, my award-winning book, Schooling for Holistic Equity, was the intellectual foundation for this manifesto. Another means of deepening your understanding of my perspective is to take my Defense Against the Dark Arts online lecture course. The course goes into leadership and the science of motivation with emphasis on practical knowledge that can help leaders with their challenges one-on-one -on -one in classrooms, in schools, and in school systems. It is time to get educators unstuck by enabling them to reliably answer the question of what counts as an educative experience and what does not. It is time, from both the personal and systemic perspectives, to make schools into places where deeper learning is the norm rather than the exception. However, that change requires a new paradigm. That paradigm, the scientific foundations of it, and how we can build a proper education system up from those foundations are what my work is all about. Prepare yourself for a brief philosophical journey into the depths of education. This concludes episode one of the Agentic Schools Manifesto series. If you would like to follow along in the book, you can join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more, as I mentioned before, at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. Thank you for your kind attention.